bigger in your life to marry to fullness. A book that I'm putting together. I love the book. Oh, I love that book. Steering your life to marry to fullness. And the last time that I stood here concerning marriage, we talked about the marriage of versions. We talked about the fact that marriage will never come to fullness, true fullness in your life until it is the marriage God created. We talked about the fact that the world has created its own version of marriage. We understood that we are a generation that are expert at building our own version of what God created. God gave us sex. We have had a perverted version of sex. So today people do oral sex and there's sodomy and there's lesbianism and there's all of those kind of things that we have created that God never gave us. Because we are experts at building our own versions of everything that God gave to us. And that is true concerning marriage. So when we're talking about marriage of fullness, I want you to understand that the only true marriage of fullness is the marriage God created. And that's what saints must go for. You can't afford to go for what the world created because the world never created. You're a new creature. The old has gone. The old that the world created has gone. The old that the tribe created has gone. The new that God has created has come. So the new that God has created must go for what God created. So you can't afford to go for the lure marriage because you're no longer lure. Somebody said say something back in here before I get beyond that. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't want to go back there because it will consume my time. Your time. Your time is the one that's normally not there. Mine is there. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so I just wanted to write it down today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, steering your life to marry to fullness. And my intent is if I have time, I will talk to you about opening your life for marriage. And I will explain why. Praise God. And if I manage to break through there, the next week is prayer. Amen. Just in case the Lord helps me to break through into that. Are you ready for this? Amen. Praise God. Steering your life to marriage of fullness. So what we call marriage of fullness is a marriage that is enjoyed. It's not a marriage that you endure. Marriage that is endured is marriage that causes the married to become weary. And when they get weary, they throw in the towel and they walk, walk away. At times, they don't walk, they run. We were never created to endure for life. So if your marriage is the kind of marriage that you endure, you need to ask yourself the question, what if this goes on for the next five years and nothing happens? Because the human life can only endure for so long. That's why every season of darkness is for a period of time. God says weeping may remain for the night, but joy must come in the morning. And when the joy comes, it compensates for the night of weeping. That's how God designed life. Hallelujah. The marriage God created is the marriage that has life. It is living. It is healthy. It's holistic. The marriage that God created is the marriage, therefore, that fulfills the purpose of marriage in your life. Everything that God created has purpose, and so does marriage. When marriage comes into your life, it comes with purpose to fulfill. And only functional, healthy, living marriage can fulfill purpose in your life. Any kind of marriage that is sick has no ability to fulfill purpose. Anything sick does not fulfill purpose. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready for this? So, I want to give you a few points about steering your life. This is something we're going to deal with much more deeply. But I just want to give you a picture of what it means to steer your life to a place. There are a couple of factors to consider. Steering your life means building marital capacity. Write it down. Marital capacity. You need to build marital capacity. Marriage is work. This is just introductory. Marriage is work. 
That is the thing that everybody needs to know. When you come to the office of marriage, you come to work. That's why we inaugurate you. Supposedly, after you've gone to marry to university and you've learned for five years. Then we call you to a wedding. A wedding is inaugural service. Just the same way that we actually get people graduated that have done a degree for six years, seven years. When you want to become a medical doctor, then we take you through a graduation ceremony. It's inaugural service. We inaugurate you into the office of function to do what you've been learning to do for six years. What now you've built capacity to handle. If we put you in that office before you go to university for six or seven years and we give you a patient, either you kill the patient or you kill yourself or you flee from that office. Somebody talk back in here. And you would be shocked to discover how many people enter the, the office of marriage and they kill the patient. You'd be shocked to discover how many people come to the office of marriage and they kill themselves. And you'd be shocked to discover how many people come to the office of marriage and because they don't have capacity, they flee. Because lack of preparation either causes you to destroy what you've entered the office to do or it destroys you or you run from it. So the moment that we get you into the wedding, it's never empty process. That's why you must never come with stray. Because when you come with stray, you come to stray. There is a process that makes a man be called husband. A man is not called husband because they went to bed. A man is not called husband because they got a child. A man has to be inaugurated into the office of a husband. The day of the wedding, after certain things have taken place, you leave that place. You entered as a man. You leave that place as a husband. Somebody calls you my husband. The moment you hear those words, you hear words of responsibility. And she's just echoing that responsibility have changed. Before you were my boyfriend, there were no demands on you. Now you are my husband. So now there are responsibilities. There's work you got to do. Woe unto you if you never went to the marital university. Am I talking to somebody in this place? That's why I don't join people after three months. I take people for one whole year of premarital sessions. Yes. Every week. And I take you through. I give you exam. I take you through tests. Assignments. And you're going to come back. And show you a past. Before I get you into the office. Well, that's right. It's stupid to put somebody in the office. Who knows nothing. <laughs> you don't. You don't, I don't think you know something because you're 38 years. How many 47-year-old men whose marriages have failed? And at times it failed not because there was a curse or a demon. It's just because the man doesn't know how to handle this woman. Could somebody smile? Let me just know you're fine. Thank you. Praise God. It's a platform of work. When you come to marriage, you come to work. You come to perform responsibility. There's duty. There's a task. I need to announce to you before I go any further. Is the marriage is the office of work where we don't have leave days and we don't have off days. <laughs> 24 7. Hallelujah. It's a platform where you come to build relationship. The moment you hear the word build, if you are called to build a house, you check your background to find out, do you have expertise? Amazingly, when we come to the marital platform to build marital relationship, we never go for any expertise. And yet the reality is, it's possible to be unable to build relationship. Think like this. You're coming from a family of seven and you don't have relationship with your brothers and sisters. All of you are chaotic. You fight every day. 
Then you come in to build a relationship with somebody that's a stranger that's grown in another world. Without going to school to learn how to build relationships. Am I making sense to somebody? Are you getting what I'm saying in here? <laughs> you need to think, if I can't build relationship with my sister, with whom we were born in the same home, how can I build relationship with somebody that was born in another county? That has grown in another world until now they are 36. And I'm 43. If you struggle to build relationship with your parents, with your brother, how can you build relationship with somebody that's a stranger who's grown up in a different world? There are things that have been built in their lives you never watched growing. At least you watch things growing up in your sister. You know the defects from childhood. <laughs> so you put up with it for so long, you can put up with it for some more years. But here's a stranger with strange defects and issues that you're just meeting. Issues that are 38 years old. <laughs> and you're supposed to handle the um, build relationship with that kind of stranger. Hallelujah. Are you ready for this? It's a platform of building relationships. It's supposed to build relationship of oneness. What God calls marriage is not marriage until the two have become one. That's the vision of God. God said, for this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. The man will cleave to his wife, cleave. That means they could part. How many of you know it's the man who cleaves? See, every time marriage breaks, the person I look at first is the man. The man cleaves. For them to become one, the man must cleave. For him to cleave, he must leave. It's such a sad thing that there's so many men that have never left Mummy's boy trying to be the husband of somebody. Somebody's daughter. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I know you know a neighbor like that. He's not you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Build relationship of oneness. You build relationship of peace. Relationship of trust. Relationship of intimacy. Relationship of friendship. Am I speaking to somebody? You're supposed to build it. If you don't build it, it will never build itself. You come to work. Come to build relationship. You come to build each other. You build each other. You build each other. Hallelujah. You build each other. When a man gets married, their lives are supposed to change for better. They should be stronger than they were before. That is true with the man, that's true with the woman. The woman is supposed to get better than she was before she met the man. Hello? Because you come to build each other. The human life never ceases to build. Let me put it a different way. The building process of the human life never ceases. We build, we are people that are built every day until the last day of your breath. And so we grow under our parents. Our parents have been building us. When we come in each other's life, we come to build each other further. To make yourself better. Your parents could bring you to a place. Your spouse is supposed to bring you higher and farther. That's why you must go to somebody that can build you. And several times you can check to confirm they can build you if they have been building themselves. Is that Okay. Praise God. We come to build each other. Number two. Number three. We come to build work. The Bible said in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter number four. And verse number nine says two are better than one. I want that to sink into anybody that's single. I want you to know single brother, single sister. You must never ever come to the place where you say I'm single but satisfied. That's nonsense from the pit of hell. It comes from Beijing gender equality message. Get out of it. God Almighty who created you says two are better than one. God say it. Not me. You find that in your Bible, not in Ken Yaffa's book. And if God looked at the man, he said it's not good for the man to be alone. It's not good for the man to be alone, period. 
So if you're not alone, if you're alone and you're a man, it's not good. God say it. So God says, two are better than one, verse number nine, for they will receive a good return for their labor. In other words, God says, every, every work that you do is called work load. And every work load demands a measure of energy for it to be converted into work done. That's a principle, all right? Now, marriage gives you the two energies that, that when combined together, provide the one resultant energy. For the greatest work. Hallelujah. It gives you the one person with whom you can achieve more than you can achieve by yourself. You come together to work. And that's why God said it's not good for the man to be alone. Let's find a helper. You need help when you have something to do. That's why several times if you're a wise man, you don't want to go to a woman if you have nothing to do. Because what is he coming come to help you do? She's a helper. For what? So wise people want to find themselves and they want to find what they were created for. At least something, even if it's a little vague. At least something. You can't sit there like a loaf of bread hoping that a woman is going to be carrying you from point B to point A. Hello, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. You come to build work together. I'm trying to run through this very quickly. This is supposed to be introductory. All right, number four. I think this should be number four. Is that okay? All right. Praise God. You come to build children. Come to build children. This, this, this can get me emotional. It's going to get me emotional. Because a child... Is a helpless creature that never applied for existence and desperately needs to be touched and raised. According to divine design, you never become anything without being built into it. According to divine design, nobody goes far without a human propeller. Nobody rises to heights of greatness without a human stepping stone. Nobody becomes anything without somebody getting to mold and grow them. And the primary builder of the human life is the parent. The moment the parent has failed, the teacher will struggle. The moment the parent has failed, the government will struggle. So a child comes helpless, desperate to be built, hoping that he will find a pair of hands that can truly touch him and make him great. Then he finds people who did not even plan for the marriage in the first place, live alone getting a child. Crisis. But the reality is, how far the child will go will be caused by parents. How great the child will become will be caused by the parents. So when you come to marriage, plan for the child as well. Let it be part of your marital budget. Number next, you come to build a family. Family is a human society. It's actually the very primary human society. It's a community. Nations are large families. Praise God. And so the primary builder of community is the parent. It's a couple that have come together. You come to build family. Family is a community of people. If the family as a community of people is sick, then the larger community called a nation will be sick. So you come to be. The, the thing that I wanted to see, I really don't want to bother with so many things. I'm just introducing this. When you come to marriage, you come to a platform of responsibility. You come to work. And work always demands capacity to handle it. Now when you are born, all you have is potential. All that you are given is potential. There's no child who is a husband. All boys, when they're born, carry the potential of a husband. 
but they are not husband. They don't have capacity to husband a woman. All women carry potential. Hallelujah. They carry potential of a great wife. But not one woman is a wife. She has potential, but not capacity. All that you are given when you come here are potentials. Potentials are possibilities. I call them seeds of possibilities. And all the seeds of possibilities must be developed to become capacity. So a great husband is made. He's not born. A great wife is made. She's not born. She was given potential at birth. And through the development process, the potentials were built into a great wife. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so, the process of building marital potentials into marital capacity is a process of steering your life. Is that making sense? To a place. You only build potentials into capacity if you want to go to a place. Right now as I'm talking to you, there is a young man who right now is in primary school. But he has a dream to become a doctor. And so suddenly you're beginning to see he's interested in certain subjects because he's trying to use his potential to build the capacity of a doctor. When he goes to high school, there will be subjects he will be interested in. He's trying to build the doctor. And as he's building the, the potentials into capacity, he's actually steering his life to the the office of a doctor. Is that making sense? That's exactly what is supposed to happen. That's why when we're talking about marriage, people that are so young should be in the meeting. The unfortunate reality is we go to the marital meetings when we are 40 and stranded. Or when we have tried marriage and we are enduring. Praise God. Hallelujah. Not many young people in their 20s are interested in marital teachings. They're not. Because they, they think that all that it requires is beauty. As long as you're sweet looking. Oh boy. Who can deny me? Now, it's one thing. <laughs> it's one thing to attract somebody. It's another thing to stay with the somebody you attracted. To attract, you need beauty. To stay with, you need capacity. Hallelujah. All right, number two. We're talking about journeying or steering your life is a process of, number one, building capacity. Number two, steering your life to marital fullness is the process of journeying. You are journeying to the place marriage. Marriage is a place you got to journey to. You journey to the place. You journey to the place. If you look at the human living process, living is the process of journeying to places of destinies. That's one of the reasons why God gave us instruments for journeying. Instruments for movement. That's where we have the feet. Am I making sense in here? That's what the Bible said in the book of Psalm 37, verse number 24, that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God. God wants to order your steps because you're journeying. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, journeying requires three significant things. Number one, it requires vision. It requires vision. It requires a vision. Without a vision, people perish. That's the reality. If you don't have marital vision, you go through marital perishing. Another version says, without a vision of people cast off restraint. It basically means there's nothing to thrive, to strive towards. And there are many people that are not striving towards marriage because they don't have a vision. I want you to store that in your spirit because as we go deeper, I will show you that all the relational accidents you've gone through, the first thing they target is to destroy your marital vision. A lot of people that got into accidents as they were journeying to a place, the thing that the journey that the accident cost them is their vision. Anybody whose vision was repaired eventually journeyed to the place he was going to before the accident. 
So when you have so many people in the church that don't want marriage, it's because they don't have, they don't have a vision. So when they see huddles in the course of marriage, then they say, mm, I'd better be safe. Say, I want to be single and satisfied. S and S. <laughs> and the reality is you're just escaping responsibility. Well, that's right. You try to run away from marriage because you had broken relationship that caused you pain. But watch this. You try to do business, it failed. Why don't you stop? The reason why you don't stop struggling to get money is because your stomach is demanding it and you can't help it. Uh huh. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So, journeying requires vision. Number two, journeying requires direction. It requires direction. It always requires direction. That's why living is done in ways. Life is lived in ways. There are ways of life. That's why the Bible says in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter number 14, verse number 12, that there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why God spoke to the Israelite, the book of Deuteronomy 10, and several times in verse number 12, all through 13, God spoke to them and said, that what does the Lord your God require of you? But to love the Lord your God with all your heart, to walk in all his ways. God is saying, I have ways. Why? They were going to a place. And when you're going to a place, you need ways. Can I tell you something? There is marital way to marital fullness. And there's a way to marital lostness. If you allow me to use that word. I'm not even sure it exists in the dictionary. We could create one. Hallelujah. Said so the end there of his destruction. There are people that have landed into married to destruction. Hello? Basically because they walked along the wrong direction. Because every journey of life demands direction. And it does matter which path you take. Every way of life leads to a place. Your financial way of life leads to a place. If you live a life where you're withholding time from God, it's leading to a place. In the book of Proverbs 11, verse number 24, it says this. It says, one man gives freely and gains even more. It's a powerful word because it talks about the freedom of giving. I like saying the freedom of giving also gives you the freedom not to give. The freedom to give also gives you freedom not to give. There are people that you give to and you're destroying them. Some of your relatives that are stranded and they're stuck because they don't want to try anything. And every time that you give them, you're actually spoiling them. They were just babies that were spoiled, that were never grown. And now they're stuck. And you give them money, they go drink it. Hello? And they come back and they want to send their children to you to take to school. Hello? Every time that you're giving to them, you're destroying them more. So when you have freedom of giving, you also have freedom not to give. But God goes on in the verse of scripture. He says, one man gives freely and yet gains even more. He says, another withholds more than is right and tends to poverty. That talks about a gradual movement towards the place of poverty. Because of withholding. So every way of life leads to a place. That's really what I want you to get. Every way of life leads to a place. Tap your neighbor say, there is somewhere you are going with this. <laughs> Come on, preach it to somebody. Tell your neighbor, there is somewhere you are going with this. Because every way leads to a place. Tell them this way of your life is leading you to a place. All right, every journey requires, number three, ready? It requires a drive, motivation. It requires a drive. There must be a drive. If the journey is going to be successful, there must be a drive. Hallelujah. Praise God. There must be a motivation, a drive. 
And I want you to understand that according to God's creation, the drive is supposed to be internal. It was never supposed to be external. You are a generation of external drive. That's why this is the generation that has multiplied motivational speakers more than any generation has ever. Because motivational speakers are people that drive you from outside. You understand? They come and talk to you nice words. You get the picture? And some people get to copy those words later. They're not in you. They're outside of you. I met somebody that we used to go, that we, we, we were in a place with some years back. And I met him on the streets. And then he told me, I'm trying to be a motivational speaker. And I looked at him and I felt for him. <laughs> See, he's learning to know how to, to do motivational speech. Get the picture? To motivate people from outside because people are not motivated inside. So they need an external motivator. It's like a vehicle that has to be battery started. So people get to push the vehicle, then you jack it up and... <laughs> You're getting what I'm saying, don't you? People don't have fire inside of them. May your motivation be built in the inside of your life. Hallelujah. As long as you don't have internal motivation, you will need supervisor and motivator. And that's why there's so many people that cannot work without a supervisor. <laughs> Hallelujah. I call them forced workers. So, you get employed. You've done a course. You've, you've gone to university. You've got your degree. You understand. You learn how to move this book from here to here. You know how to do it so well. You, you get some slot in some company that's advertised. Right? They want somebody that has the, the expertise to move this book from here to here, which you did so well in the university. And so you apply. They give you an interview. You get the picture? And then they qualify you, they give you the job. But then because they know you're not motivated from inside to work. They know you don't have internal, personal motivation in the inside to do what you learned how to do. They have to employ supervisor. Supervisor, write this down, is someone with superior vision. So the supervisor has to appear in the office before you start to work. Before the supervisor comes, you're actually talking on the phone. You know how to do the work, but you will not do it until the supervisor shows up. Uh-oh. Did I get somebody in here? Praise God. All right. So anyway, we need driver. Without internal, personal merit or drive, you will struggle. Praise God. So whoever you are listening to me, I want you to know that God wants you to have a personal merit or drive. Hallelujah. Praise God. So every journey needs, number one, vision. It needs direction. It needs drive. If you're truly going to arrive at the place of marital fullness, whether you're married already or you're still single, you will need those, right? Praise God. Steering your life to marital fullness basically means racing towards the place of marital goal or marital prize. I want you to listen to me carefully. Living is the process of racing. That's one of the most amazing things that I want you to never lose. We race. That's why in the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 4, when Paul finishes the course of his life, Paul speaks these words. But number 6, he said, the time has come for my departure, for I'm now about ready to be poured out like a drink offering. He said, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Paul says, my living process was a race. In the book of Hebrews 12, verse number 1, the apostle speaks these words. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every weight that hinders. I want you to mark that. The weights that sit on people, but they hinder. Hallelujah. 
and the sin that so easily entangles. Look at the next word. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. Because living is racing. Now, a race is different from a journey. Because a race is a journey that has speed towards a prize. Right? That one, that one down. A prize. Not price. Prize. It's the one with Z. That make sense? The race is always a movement towards a prize. There is some goal that you want to score. There is a prize that you want to benefit from. That's why you're racing. All right. Now, there are three factors about racing that are so important, you must never lose them. And the first one is speed. Write that down. When you're dealing with race, speed is important. You ready for this? Hallelujah. Speed is important. That's why the apostle says, throw off every weight that hinders. Because there are things that can slow you down. If you go to London Marathon and you are slowed down, will you get the prize? No. Hallelujah. If you go for Olympic and you're supposed to be running the 100 meters race and something sits on you and slows you down, will you get the prize? No. Because in a race, speed matters. Hallelujah. Speed matters. That is true with marital race. Speed matters. Factor number two that affects race is competitors. In every race, there are competitors. There are competitors. There are factors that compete against the one that is racing towards the prize. That's one of the reasons why we actually have many different medals. Jesus. So, when you have a race, then there's gold, then there's silver. Am I making sense? Then there is bronze. Then there's nothing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. They're competitors. So they're factors that can overtake you and take your gold. That's why you got to run fast. So when you truly understand the race of life, then you build speed. Because you understand you can't afford to be the slow one. Because if you were slow and these factors overtake you, they will take your gold. And by the time you arrive, you will find gold has gone. You have silver. And at times, you find two factors overtook you. And they took gold and silver. So you got bronze. But at times, there are three factors that overtook you. And they took the gold and the silver and the bronze. And they left you nothing. And you'll be shocked to discover how many people race towards the marital finish line. And they had gold. They really wanted the gold. A girl who wanted a gold husband. From childhood, you had this kind of dream of the man that you want to marry. And you said, if I get this man, I'm going to give her all my life. She was the dream of the kind of woman you wanted, like Jacob. When Jacob found Rachel, the man broke down, the man began to cry. He knew from childhood this was the kind of woman that I knew if I find this one, I will give her the rest of my life. When he met Rachel, the man broke down. He looked, he couldn't believe. He thought he was in a movie. He began to cry. Hallelujah. He began, a man who used to be talkative suddenly had no words. He opened his mouth to say anything. It couldn't come out. <laughs> and the reason is simple. He found that gold dream that he had been racing towards. Mm. But so many people, by the time we come to the marriage finish line, we look at the person we've married. <laughs> and at times, even days before the wedding, I've dealt with people who days before the wedding, they're wondering, Lord of mercy, do I go for this? <laughs> I saw a sister, a sister who had a wedding outside of this country. I don't want to say which one. Hallelujah. And then after the wedding, immediately after the wedding, she packed her bag and she ran back to Kenya. <laughs> because at, some, at times somebody, even the days before the wedding, you're wondering, am I making a mistake? Am I not making a... And the reason is simple. You're looking, you're looking back 
are the vision you've always had. And there you see gold. But here you see silver. At times bronze. And at times no metal. At all. All the three have gone. So you wake up after the wedding and you're wondering, what is this? What happened to me? And many times people don't talk these things. And they can actually be thinking for 10 years. You lie beside somebody and you're wondering, mm, uh, how did it get to me? <laughs> and the reason is simple. <laughs> so it causes what I call marital disappointment. Somebody feels cheated. And the Bible says these words. This is, this is powerful. In the book of Proverbs 13, verse number 11, verse number 12, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Your gold was your hope. It drove you. It kept driving you. The moment you come to the realization that what you have is not a medal, then you have hope, hope deferred and it makes your heart sick. And some people endure that for years in their lives. By the time you see a marriage break, don't, don't buy into somebody telling you yesterday, you know, this happened and today I decided to leave. No. This thing has happened for years. The things that cause people to break their marriage are things that have been there for years. When somebody now refuses to go for um, reconciliation, when somebody refuses to go for conflict resolution, when now you're pleading with your spouse and you're saying, let's sort this thing out, and they're not interested. They're not, they're not just not interested in the conflict resolution process. They're not interested in the relationship in the first place. And if you wind the clock backwards, you will discover that this has taken years building up in the inside of their hearts. Hello, are you still in the house? I don't want to talk alone. Can you get what I'm saying in here? Praise God. Yeah, it's possible to get married to gold. It's possible to get married to silver, bronze, and no metal at all. It's possible. Hallelujah. Number three, we're talking about the factors that determine a race. Number one, we talked about what? Speed, thank you. Number three. Number two? Thank you. Number three is the value of your life. Write, write it down. I don't have the time to do this, but I have a book coming that is called Building the Value of Your Life or Building Personal Worth. Now, one of the most amazing things that you will do yourself favor to discover is this, that the human being is a consumer product in a marketplace. Right now, can I tell you something? You are feeding off of Kenyatta. Yes. If what I'm feeding you on is delicate, you'll come again on Monday. Praise God. Am I making sense? Because we are consumer products. And every consumption is always driven by appetite. So if what I'm giving you is giving you appetite, you will want to come again. Am I making sense? We are consumer products. That's why... That's why the human being is a purchased product in the marketplace. If you have 10 men line themselves up here, you will find, hallelujah, if we were to be traded on, you'd find people would actually quote different prices. Come on, talk back in here. If people were to buy shares in the stock market, you'd find the stock market would actually put price tags, different price tags on different heads. In this meeting, not everybody would actually fetch the same amount. Why? Because we are valuable products in the marketplace. That makes sense. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's huge stuff. It's huge stuff. That's why one of the most important things you can ever do for yourself is to discover how to increase your personal life worth. Uh, 
I'll confront you with that years from now if the Lord keeps me coming to Kisumu. Hallelujah. So what happens is this. That happens also on the marital platform. On the marital platform, we actually buy each other. Yes, that's right. For a man to call a woman his wife, right? The word my wife is possessive. It, it actually talks about ownership. The question is, when did you own this girl to be able to call her my? How dare you call somebody's daughter my? You get the picture? I don't own this precious, beautiful woman of God. If I was to ever be hurt by this precious man, very humble man of God, if he was to hear me calling his wife my wife, it's possible he can do something terrible, repent later. <laughs> and one of the things I know he will never do again is he will never come to my meeting. But what is it that gives him such audacity to call this precious woman my wife, but if somebody else tries, he wants to fight? It's because there is a process of acquiring this girl to become his. There is a process that made even the parents and the people that owned her before to surrender their ownership to this man so that from that moment he owns. Now watch this. On the marital platform, I want you to listen, listen, I'm about to close. On the marital platform, we do not buy with money. No. We don't buy with money. We don't even use what we call dowry. Dowry actually is not in the Bible. Dowry is a word that was coined by greedy parents that never had value for their daughters. The previous generations, men never had value for their daughters. They saw a girl as somebody that you can exchange for goods. They saw a girl as somebody that you will raise and then she's going to leave to go build somebody else's home. And so because of that, many parents didn't even take their children to school. So they took the boys to school and they refused to take the girl to school. So the girl was fed and was clothed just basically because she was going to fetch goats. So she was equivalent to a hundred goats. There is a value in the home. That's where the word dowry was coined from. It was coined from greedy people that never saw value in their daughter. But a woman was never meant to be valueless. I don't have the time to talk to you about this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Today when we wake up to the reality, the potential that was in the woman, we have seen a woman pilot. Well, we've seen a man who cannot even ride a bicycle. <laughs> we've seen women presidents. Some of them have governed their nations much better than their male counterparts that governed the nations before. So we are discovering the secret on this female being that is called the woman. And we are discovering she was never created to be less than the man. So if you go together, please don't carry cows. Refuse. Go talk to the parents. And tell them I refuse to give you cows for a human being. That is this important. <laughs> See, kingdom living is rebellion against the kingdoms of this world. If you're not ready to rebel against the kingdoms of this world, forget about kingdom. That's why Jesus said from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God.
suffers violence in the violent. You know what the word violent means? It means to violate. That's why true kingdom people cannot follow cultures and tribal traditions. You can't do that. Everywhere you find Paul preaching, you find one of the reasons why there's a revolt against Paul's message. They say, these men are Jews and they are advocating cultures that we cannot follow. Because the kingdom of God has a culture. If you still follow tribal culture, it's because you've not discovered the culture of your kingdom. So, a sober parent like Ken Yaffer, when it comes to give away his daughter, then he wants to check the young man because he knows when he gives away his daughter, he's going to get a son. A son. You're getting the life of a son. You're getting a young man that will close your eyes. A young man that will buy you a car. Who will build you a house. A young man that if you have a crisis in life in the future, you will not call your daughter. You will call your son. And you will say, son, I'm in a fix. Do you have any ability to help me? Get the picture. That's the exchange at marriage. So sober parents don't ask for goats. Goat. <laughs> a thousand goats? Hallelujah. But when the man comes to own the woman, not just taking the woman from the parents, you come to buy each other. Are you ready for this? You buy each other. Before you can own, you're going to buy each other. When you come to buy each other, again, you don't use money. For you to call this woman your wife, you don't use money to buy her. No. And she doesn't use money to buy you to call you her husband. You use the most highly valuable product that you have in your life. It is your life. So, when you come to the covenant platform, the platform of exchange of vows, then you come into a transactional process called the covenant. The covenant legalizes marital transaction. It legalizes ownership of each other. And on the platform of the, of the, the covenant, you make a vow to give each other the rest of your life. So, you look at the girl and you say, I'm 31. And the girl is 29. And he said, I'm going to live to be 100 years. How about that, baby? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you tell her, I'm giving you the next 69 years of my life. Everything that I become, you become. If I become president, you're the first lady without any qualification. You don't need to go to school to become first lady. You will find a first lady office automatically open for you. Because I've become president. My status gives you status. If I become wealthy, you are wealthy. Unfortunately, of course, if I become poor, you understand. <laughs> Hallelujah. You get the picture. Hallelujah. You give her the rest of your life. That's why you say, until death do us part. So she gives you the rest of her life. You give her the rest of your life. That's why courtship it's never supposed to be dating. Dating is for the fallen world. Actually, if you look at the, 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 the world, uh, the, the, you know, the Western world, dating is a romantic venture. It's where you're coming to fuel the flames of your emotional feelings. And at times, sensual. That's what they call dating. Dating is supposed to be negotiations of covenant terms. You are coming to do courtship. Courtship is a very interesting process because when you come to marriage, you're actually coming to prison. And before you go to prison, you must go to court. That's right. The moment you give your life to a woman in that marriage, you've entered a prison. And it's life sentence. 
If you're a man, you have no space for another woman until death do you part. What is that? Prison. No appeal. Thank you. <laughs> Am I talking sense? Are you kidding what I'm saying in here? That's where you go to court. It's called courtship. Hallelujah. And in this process of courtship, you are negotiating. You're telling the girl, I'm going to be president one day. And my wife will be first lady. So this is the kind of woman I want. I don't want a woman that will sit in the first lady's office and people will actually mistake her for the messenger in that office. I want a woman that has a vision to be the, the president of a husband, of, of a, the, the wife of a president. Look at the picture. So you negotiate. That's where you give your terms and conditions for marriage. Hello? That's why you tell the girl what you want in a wife. And that's where the girl tells you what she wants in a husband. Hello? We were never supposed to stake our marriage on current affairs. You know current affairs? Present emotional and sensual feelings. That's what I call current affairs. So many people set wedding date on the basis of current affairs. So in the future, when the person is not possible to live with, and the current affairs have stopped. Come on, talk to me. As I'm talking to you right now, somebody that was in courtship five years ago that loved a girl to death on the basis of current affairs is now killing his wife as I'm talking to you right now. And the reason is because the feelings have changed. So the current affairs are different. So warn to you, if you get into marriage because of current affairs, the moment somebody's wise, then you begin to see marriage as something for the rest of your life. You see future. So you put current affairs in their place. You appreciate the feelings you have for one another, but you go deeper because there's something more you want than feelings. In any case, what will sustain the feelings you have right now is the person you're marrying. Am I talking sense? You don't want a, a, a woman that looks beautiful on the outside. You know, the physical body is like the house you live in. You getting what I'm saying? <laughs> getting what I'm saying? So, if, if you're just going for the physical beauty, then what happens is, and the person inside is not a wife, a knife. Then what happens is, <laughs> you're like somebody that saw a beautiful house and inside was a woman with a knife. So, you go knock the door, and suddenly she comes out with a knife, and you want to run. You understand what I'm saying? Praise God. You want to see future. There are factors you can look in a man's life, and you see future. Come on, talk to me. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. You walk with a man shortly, and you begin to see factors that are future factors. Factors of a man that is anchored. A man that can get to honor covenant terms. A man that is not unstable. Hallelujah. Praise God. A man that is a leader. Every woman wants a leader. You don't want a man that you should lead. Every woman wants a man that is going to be over her life as somebody she can submit to. You don't want a man that will need to submit to you. So there are factors that everybody should look at that are future factors that are more than the present factors. Am I talking to someone in this place? I beg you to go back to Nairobi. Praise God. I will come again next week and talk to you about how to open your life for marital fullness. Open your life because there are so many people under the sound of my voice whose lives are closed to marriage, but they don't know. Some of them are actually married. And the reason why your marriage is choking you up is because your life has always been closed to marriage. I want to come talk to you next week. And if you know a neighbor like that, family member or brother, praise God, whose life is close to marriage, bring them next Monday. We're going to talk stuff. Are you ready? Let's rise up so we can close the service, please.